title of today's sermon is Grace or Race and Peace at Pentecost. And Daryl mentioned in his prayer that today is Pentecost Sunday, and I want to just talk a little bit about what Pentecost is and what it says to us, what, what uh, values, what promises, what hope that it speaks to us in the midst of this current situation that we're in. You know, as we as I woke up this morning, I immediately turned on the news because I was really wondering what had happened last night. Because every night, every night we, uh, we every morning we wake up, we find out about new uh, riots, new protests, new uh, challenges that are being experienced all around the country. And as I kind of mentioned before in the service, but I want to make clear again here, I have no a pretense about having all the answers, having all the solutions, uh, even understanding everything that needs to be understood about the problems in our country related to racism, related to uh, systemic prejudice and, and uh, the ways that different people and different people groups are marginalized. I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't uh, know how to say everything that needs to be said about it. But what I want to do today, what I hope to do today, is just talk about kind of two big ideas from Pentecost that, that can inform us about this moment and about how we might be able to respond in part. So if we were, if we were gathered in a building this morning, I think it would be really great to kind of hear from one another and have an extended conversation about what we can do as different people in our in our little church community. So, you know, I look around this call and we've got uh, folks here who uh, have Latino backgrounds, right? And African and African-American backgrounds, Asian backgrounds, uh, European backgrounds. And yet we're all here in this place, you know, the United States, but most of us are even here in New England. And we're all gathered on this video call right now. And so what does God want us to know and what does he want us to do? Uh, and again, not all of it, not the fullness of it, not the whole part of it, but what are some things that we can identify this morning and we can focus on this morning to help us and to respond? Because I think for a lot of us, and you know, obviously, I mean, this is very obvious. I'm speaking as a white guy, a white man, right? So my perspective, is going to be different from someone else's. And I think one of the things that we need to do as a community is we need to be open to hearing all sorts of perspectives. And so I'm just going to kind of lay out some assumptions and, and kind of founding ideas that I'm coming from that'll help you understand where I'm coming from. And not again, not to say that they're all correct or that they're complete, but I think it'll help us to kind of frame out this conversation and the sermon here that we're having together, this time we have together in the Word. So just the first thing that I want to say is, um, I think I think the there is a, a a desire among many white Americans to pretend that racism is no longer a problem in our country. And I just want to state up front that I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that uh, that is uh, a people honoring thing to assert given the given what we see in our in our country and i don't think it's a god honoring thing to assert i think that there are a lot of people who live in harmony with people of other races yes but that doesn't mean that racism is gone um, another thing that i want to just kind of put out there is i don't think i don't personally think that uh, race is something or ethnicity or skin color or however we're going to talk about it is something that needs to divide us. And so I would press back against some of the, um, some kind of theories of intersectionality and that, that kind of imply or even state outright that, that race has to be a, a dividing force in our lives. I don't think that has to be. I don't think that's the way God intends it because when we look at the picture of heaven in the book of Revelation, every tongue, tribe, and nation is gathered together worshiping the Lord in harmony and unity. And by the way, they are probably not singing and worshiping in English and they don't all look like they're, you know, white people or, you know, even, even, you know, dress the way that some of us might dress. I mean, we need to kind of get out of some of our conceptual conceptualizations of what that means and what it looks like, but it does, it does still stand that, that that is the goal and that is the end point that God is 
moving us towards in one way or another. Uh, and I would also just kind of put out there that I, I'm a, everything that I read in scripture and everything that I see in the world points me to the reality that humanity is indeed broken by the fall and by sin. And so these are just kind of some three, three ideas. You know, one is that racism is real, that it's not the way it's supposed to be, but we're all broken and fallen. And so those things are going to come into tension as we talk today. And as I share from the scripture and, and honestly, I'll be sharing some of my own ideas, which some of them you may accept, some of them you may not, but hopefully we can agree on what the scripture says about this today. And then finally, I just confess my own concern because, you know, it'd be very easy for me to get up here and say something stupid or say something offensive to somebody. And if I offend you today, then, um, I, I want to I want to challenge you to wrestle with it and see if it's an offense that's coming from the truth of God's word or if it's really is something that I'm doing wrong. And if it's something I'm doing wrong, I want you to challenge me to correct my thinking or to correct my speak my speech, you know, because I don't want to stay in a place that's offensive unnecessarily. But if it's the word of God that offends, then then I'll 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 stay with that. I'm going to stick with that. And uh, I'm going to let it offend me, and I'm going to let it offend whoever it needs to offend, but I don't want to do it needlessly. So is that kind of a fair place to start? Can we, can we start in that place? Um, I'm seeing some nodding heads and some thumbs up, so I'm hoping that that's okay. Uh, you know, and I, I don't mean any of this kind of um, cavalierly. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be offensive, as I said, but, you know, I hope it's not. But as we look at the, the day of Pentecost. So if you don't know what the day of Pentecost is, basically in the Jewish tradition, um, Passover is the remembrance of the time. The celebration of Passover is the remembrance of the time that God took his people out of Egypt. So out of slavery. So if you know the story of the history of Israel, Israel is actually named after Jacob. Jacob's other name is Israel. So Jacob was basically a, a wandering nomad, you know, going from place to place. He had no home. He ends up um, taking shelter, if you will, in the family of his, of his mother. He ends up marrying two women because he's tricked into marrying one of them. Uh, but then he flees that land and kind of goes into a form of exile and he's wandering around. And so Israel has no home. Israel has no place that is their own, you know, the, this group of people, but because of a famine, they go into Egypt and you may know the story of Joseph who interprets dreams and stores grain and saves, saves the ancient world from seven years of drought and famine. And when this drought and famine is going on, then Israel, Jacob and his sons and all their sons and family come into Egypt to receive help from the famine. But while they're there, the Egyptians ultimately enslave them and oppress them and put them in bondage. And when they're put in bondage, they're there for about 400 years and God sees and hears their cries for release. And he starts to bring Israel out of Egypt. And he does this by these 10 plagues. And you know about the frogs and the flies and the water of the Nile turning into blood. And then finally, there's this essentially an angel of death who comes and kills the firstborn son of every family in Egypt. But the Jewish people, the Israelites, they took blood from lambs and painted that blood on their doorposts of their homes. And whenever the angel of death saw that blood, he would pass over that home and not kill the firstborn in that home. And so that's why it's called Passover. And then God brought his people out of Egypt and he told them that he wanted them to celebrate the Passover but the tradition states that 50 days after Passover is when the people arrived at Mount Sinai and God gave them the law. So Pentecost means 50 days in Greek. So the later uh, Greek speaking Jews gave this holiday or this remembrance day, the name of Pentecost. You may hear the Hebrew name Shavuot and uh, it's a festival. It's a harvest festival, but it's also the recognition of the giving of the law. And so if, if we were to look at what happens, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20. 
And in Exodus chapter 20, we have the giving of the law. And actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to look a little bit at Exodus chapter 19, just for some context. But it says, on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. This is chapter 19 of Exodus. And after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you're to tell the people of Israel. The descendants of Jacob and the people of Israel are the same thing. Jacob and Israel are one. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And so sometimes we think about the, the giving of the Ten Commandments as just uh, these laws that, that God gives to Israel, but it's really not. The Ten Commandments, or as the Hebrew calls them, the Ten Words. The Ten Words are actually a, a covenant that God is making with the people of Israel. He's establishing a covenant that if they will obey him, and the obedience is outlined primarily in these ten words, these ten statements, then he will bless them. He will make them his own nation. They will be his treasured possession, and they will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so what God is doing with the with giving of these, these ten commandments, these ten words, is he's establishing Israel as a nation. Okay? And so it's not just that he's giving them rules. He's actually telling them, look, I've redeemed you, I've purchased you, I've paid for your freedom, and now you're going to be mine, and this is the agreement that we're going to have between us. All right, so then in Exodus chapter 20, it says, God spoke all these words. And it starts with, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make, not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous, jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love for a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female, female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your, in your towns. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy." Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover, you covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servants, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. And they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And so what we, what we see here is that God is laying out a covenant, an agreement about how people should live. And if you notice, there's, a, there's basically it's split into two groups. And we talked about this very recently, the great commandment when, when the lawyers asked Jesus what the greatest commandment is. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the other is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And right here in the Ten Commandments, we have love of God. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make a graven image, no idolatry. You shall not use the Lord's name in vain and remember the Sabbath and keep it holy because on the seventh day, the Lord rested. So that's love of God. And then you have love of neighbor. Honor your father and mother, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, and do not covet. And so God has laid out right here in the beginning of his relationship with Israel, the pattern by which he expects them to follow him. Now, 
you know, we were having a conversation around our own dinner table the other night about what was going on and kind of sharing with our kids. And it was a hard conversation uh, to share about the, the hate and the violence and the anger and the death that's been going on in our country. And, you know, some tears were shed and it was a hard conversation. But there was one point where, you know, one of our kids said, well, what if we just all stopped being racist? What if we just all did the right thing? And it, it really struck me. Uh, and we had to talk about uh, racism, which exhibits itself as, as a perspective and a feeling and thoughts and ideas. And then we had to talk about racism that really is uh, expressed in systems and structures and, and you know, the systemic kind of, kind of racism that we see in the world, which is absolutely you know, uh, an attack from Satan on our world, right? You know, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, you know, I said, God has given us, God has given us the, the right commands, the right teaching that if we would follow it, if we would do uh, what the 10 commandments say, if we rightly understood the 10 commandments and follow them, then none of these problems would be happening. So for example, one of the problems of racism is that there are people who put their racial identity above everything else. Now this is, again, I talked about different types of racism. One type of racism is just prejudicial feelings against someone else based on their skin color. That's a type of racism. That's a form of idolatry. That's a form of saying that, you know, my skin color is more important than my allegiance to the Lord. And I think as a church, we need to, you know, stand and say, that's not acceptable. It's ungodly. It's not righteous. It's not good. And we need to stand up and say, no, we will never put our skin color or our cultural background or our racial identity group above the Lord, because we love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and all our strength. And Jesus says very explicitly, you can't say that you hate your brother, and he's using brother very expansively there, and say that you love God, right? It, you just can't do it. You, if you have hate in your heart for another person, then you can't love God. And so if you're putting that prejudice, uh, if, if you're living out that prejudice, then you, you really are creating an idol of that because it's more important for you to, to do that than to, uh, to be obedient to and to love the Lord. And you know, this whole idea of um, if, you, if, you, if we were to love God well, then we would actually love our neighbor well also. And so the Ten Commandments don't explicitly say, uh, do not oppress someone. They don't. But what we also have in the Old Testament is we have these other 600 plus laws that are the outworking of the Ten Commandments. And God is very clear about how we treat other people, to treat other people with fairness to treat other people rightly, justly. You know, in Micah 6, it says, he has shown you, human, man, men and women, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There's nothing just and merciful and humble about racism, about treating people as less than because of their skin color, because of their ethnic background, because of their cultural background, because of the way they dress or talk or look. There's nothing about that that fulfills the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself the way both the Old and New Testament express it. And so we should pursue this. We should pursue as a nation the Ten Commandments. Now, the reality is, as a nation, we have attempted to reject the Ten Commandments at every turn. And I want to be really clear what I'm saying here. I honestly, I think there's, I think there's a lot of good things that would happen by posting the Ten Commandments in a classroom. I think there's a lot of good things that would happen by posting the Ten Commandments at a courthouse. But I also think that as Christians, sometimes we get so focused on that, on where, where, when and where they're posted, that we overlook the reality that we are, by our actions, denying them as a nation. And often as Christians, we're denying them. So whenever, for example, now I, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. You know, I grew up in, in the place where Martin Luther King was shot and killed. I grew up um, in a place, it's a city that 
uh, is the, I think the majority of the population of the city is African American, mostly because white people kept moving further and further away from the city. So there is a, there is a neighborhood in Memphis called White Haven and only black people live there. It's so ironic, you know, basically white people were moving away from black people and they established a community of White Haven and then they moved out of that neighborhood and now it's mostly black people who live there. You know, this is, and these are, this is in a place that's majority Christian, you know, so these are Christian men and women who are not living out the 10 commandments or the, the heart of the 10 commandments, which is to love God and love neighbor. And they saw no contradiction with it. None. It, it, they didn't see that those two were not compatible. And I think we need to take a good hard look, not at just where the 10 commandments are posted. I mean, that's an easy thing to look at and it's not unimportant. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is it pales in comparison to whether these 10 commandments are written on our hearts and whether we're living them out in our lives. And I say that as someone who breaks the 10 commandments every single day. You know, God says in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know, if you, if you harbor hang, anger in your heart, it's the same as murder. Jesus has a very high standard of the definitions of, of the 10 commandments. I have anger in my heart. I express anger. So in God's eyes, I'm like a murderer. I break the 10 commandments. So I say that, and yet I still need and must press into obedience to the 10 commandments. I have to, and we as a nation have to. And what we need to do as believers is we need to model the type of hum humility and justice and mercy that is an outworking of the 10 commandments before the world so that they want to follow the 10 commandments with us. I think as Christians, we often go out and we point fingers. You should do this. You should do that. You should follow the Lord. You should follow God. And we do it sometimes with a type of anger in our heart that contradicts the very message that we're trying to share. Now, in some ways, uh, you know, I'm speaking to my, my white brothers and sisters here because I think that many of us have either done that actively or we've passively let others do it in the name of Christ and not said anything. Right? That, that has happened. And I've been guilty of it. I think probably all of us at some point have been guilty of it. But also, uh, the, the word of God is, is a double-edged sword, and it always cuts both ways. And so, you know, the, we all, whatever your ethnic background, whatever your racial background, whatever your experience in history with racism or, or any other type of prejudice is, this, this teaching will always cut both ways. And that's the difficult reality of it. I think, this is my perspective, I think that a lot of times, because in this, in this country, white people do have um, a, a majority, and white people do have, uh, we hold a lot of the levers of power, even if a lot of us individually do not hold a lot of levers of power, as an as a ethnic group, we do. And there's just, it just is. It's just the way it is. It's true we need to be especially willing to step into the, the challenge of recognizing our own failures in that area and not so quickly pointing to the failures of others. So I think what one of the things that the gospel does and that the 10 commandments do is they point us to look at ourselves first. And Jesus says, you know, you're pointing out the speck in someone else's eye, but you've got a plank in your own eye. We always need to be looking to our own failures, our own, uh, shortcomings first. And, but I think that's particularly pertinent to any member of a group that's actually in power. One of the things that God says over and over in the Old Testament, and it's all really a commentary on the Ten Commandments. I think all of the laws are a commentary in some way on the Ten Commandments. It's either how you worship God well or how you treat your neighbor well. That's what they're all about. Is that God particularly, consistently, and emphatically sides with the oppressed over the oppressor, always. And this can get complicated because obviously in certain moments, any particular individual can be oppressed. And that's true. And we need to stand up for individuals who are oppressed. 
but there can also be people groups who are oppressed. And, you know, I've seen on, uh, on social media a lot, it's kind of thing like, yeah, this horrible thing happened to George Floyd, but what about these horrible things that happened to other people? And part of me says, absolutely, we care about the horrible things that happen to other people. We, have to, we care about the horrible things that happen to other white people. We care about the horrible things that happen to, in other ethnic groups. But it's also appropriate to take some time and to rest in the pain and the difficulty and potentially the challenging reflection that we see when it's happening to, in this case, a minority group consistently, not always, but enough to see a pattern, right? Uh, it was, I had someone tell me this week, uh, you know, it's horrible if anyone is lynched. You know, a lynching is a, mur is a killing that takes place outside of a judicial setting. It's horrible if anyone's lynched. But good records indicate that since the end of the Civil War, there have been four times as many African Americans lynched in this country as there have been white people lynched in this country. And yet they make up a minority of the population. So if you put it on a scale, it's many times over, many times over. We have to sit with that. We have to, we can't avoid it. So what do we do? We press into the 10 commandments. But as I said, there's a tension here because I know that we're fallen and broken human beings. And the challenge is that we are unable to follow the 10 commandments. We can't do it. And if you think you can, then just go look at Jesus's application of the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, if you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you're angry at your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. I mean, the standards are impossibly high, and they're impossibly high by design. Because God is so incredibly holy, and he is pointing out to us our complete inability to do this on our own. You know, we sang, we are not enough, right? We are not enough, so we have to rest in love. So what does that look like, resting in love? Well, it looks like the other aspect of Pentecost. So Easter falls at the same time as Passover. 50 days after Passover is Shavuot with the giving of the law. 50 days after Easter is Pentecost with the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter 2, we see that God gives the Holy Spirit. And I pulled up this uh, painting. It's a very, um, it's, a, it's a great rendition, if you will, of the story of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Because what happens is, we read in the end of the book of Luke, that Jesus tells his, the very, the very last thing he tells his disciples before he ascends into heaven, is that he tells them to wait in Jerusalem until they are clothed with power from on high. He says, I'm going to fulfill the promise that my father has given you. Remember, Jesus said another counselor like me would come. And so in Luke chapter, um, when Acts chapter two, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. These are the disciples who, who had gathered together after Jesus was raised up into heaven. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so in this image, you've got the, the dove, which is a representation of the Spirit coming down from heaven, and then fire coming out from the dove, and it's going to rest on each of those people. And though, what you have there, you've got the 11 disciples, because Judas is no longer with them. And I think you have two Marys. And in most of the paintings I saw, the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was right in the center. That's the way the, the ancient church uh, viewed it, that she was right in the center, and that these tongues of fire would come down on their heads and represented the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they boldly proclaimed the good news, and they were empowered to follow Jesus. Now, what, what does that mean, that, that they were empowered to follow Jesus? Well, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he is he is the one who enables us to be obedient to the law in ways that we were never able to be obedient before. And, you know, we can look at what happened through the book of Acts. And so it starts with them speaking in these, um, 
earthly tongues. So they were each speaking and everyone would hear them in their own language, preaching the gospel. So they were boldly witnessing and proclaiming the good news. And, they were, and the Spirit enabled them to do it in such a way that everyone heard them in their own language. And people thought they were crazy. They said, You're, you guys are drunk. And, and Peter said, we're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Now, I know that's not enough evidence for some people to indicate that they're not drunk. But he says, that can't be. It's too early. And then he starts to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, when he proclaims the good news, he starts with the bad news. Because the good news of Jesus Christ is always in contrast to the bad news. And the bad news is this. He tells them, look, and he's Jewish, and he's talking to Jewish people. And he says, look, you Jews, you put Jesus on the cross, and you murdered him. You killed him, even though he was the Son of God, even though he was righteous and holy. Even though he had done nothing wrong, you put him to death. And I think when we read that passage, we all need to let that prick hit home for ourselves. Because it wasn't just the Jews who put Jesus on the cross. It was also the Romans who put Jesus on the cross. And it wasn't just the Romans who put Jesus on the cross. It was every single person who has sin in their life because Jesus would not have been on the cross. He didn't have to be there. He would not have been there if we didn't need a Savior who could redeem us from our sin. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb whose blood was put on the doorpost, just like in the Passover, so that when death comes for us, it will pass over. Now our bodies will die, but we will not die. We will live eternally with God, with Christ in heaven, and then on the new earth that God creates. And so that is our Passover lamb, Jesus. Jesus would not have had to die if death were not coming for us, and death would not be coming for us if we had not been in sin. But what God knew was that we could never fully obey the Ten Commandments. We could never keep the covenant that he made with his people ever. So he needed to send Jesus, Jesus who is fully God and fully man, to take upon himself our own sin and to bring forgiveness and freedom for all of us. Now, when Jesus did that, he said, there's another like me who's coming, the Holy Spirit, and he will empower you, right? You'll have power from on high. You'll be clothed with power from on high to enable you to do the things that I've done. And sometimes when we hear that, we focus on miracles and healings, and we should, but also obedience, also righteousness, also justice. You know, the Hebrew word for righteousness and the Hebrew word for justice is the same word. They're not distinct. And so when God calls us to justice, he calls us to righteousness. And when he calls us to righteousness, he calls us to justice. And sure, there are times when the word is used slightly differently and focuses on one aspect or one nuance over another. But the point is that in the mind of God, in the, in the reality of God's holiness, is that being holy and righteous can never be separated from being just. And so we have to find ways to be just, to, to, to seek justice, right? Not just not just righteousness as a personal internal reality, but righteousness as a communal reality. And so God is always telling his people in the Old and the New Testament, stand up for those who are oppressed. Stand up if someone bears false witness against them. And don't you dare ever bear false witness against them. I mean, I honestly, when I read and heard the story, and I forget her name, of the woman in Central Park who called the police faking fear when she was acting aggressive and angry, and then on the phone she acts fearful and lies about what's happening to get another person uh, in trouble instead of facing up the fact that, you know, she just needs to put her dog on a leash. It was so telling. It's such a stark and, and um, vivid image of what can happen at any point and does happen in many points in this country and throughout the world and throughout history. It's not new. It's nothing's going on new here. And what really struck me, and Sonia and I were talking about this, is the guy's filming her. I mean, she's on video. She still does it. What would cause anyone to do that type of thing when they know they're going to get caught, if they would stop and think for a second? Is they've, they've left the rational space in their mind and they've gone into an irrational place. 
They've gone into a non-thinking place. And what happens if we're not careful is that, you know, thoughts, prejudices, ideas that most of the time will not surface in a moment where we lose our logic, we lose our reason, they come out and we do things that we otherwise wouldn't do. I bet you that woman normally doesn't do stuff like that. I bet you she really feels bad. I bet she does. I don't know that she does. It's just, I think, she, I think it's probable. And yet there was something inside her that came out in that moment. Now, so then what do we do if, if the law, the 10 commandments, these 10 words of God, if they are an answer, but we can't fulfill them, but then God has sent his Holy Spirit to enable us and empower us to walk a different kind of life. And again, I'm speaking as someone who fails to do it every single day. And we all do. What do we need to do? Well, you know, I think it's really not, uh, really not too complicated, although it will be very hard to do. Number one is, Look, we need to be praying daily for the Holy Spirit to work in me, work in you, work in our neighbors, work in our country, work in us to, to bring out the character of Christ in us. You know, one of the things that I pray, not every day, but I pray regularly is, you know, I, I thank the Lord for the gift of Jesus Christ. I thank the Lord for his sacrifice. And I kind of receive again the, the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, but then I asked that the Lord would manifest in me or that, that in my own actions, the character of Christ would be expressed. And praying that is not, it's not a, a magical, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's, it's not a spell. It's not a magic spell. If you pray that prayer, it doesn't mean that you're going to do everything right that day. There are no magic spells. There are no talismans in Christianity. But what you are doing is you're asking the God of the universe to work good through you, right? To will and to act according to his purposes that we read in Philippians. And then I'm also orienting my mind and my heart and my desires towards that goal for that day. That's why I need to do it every day. I don't do it every day, but I need to do it every day because I so easily forget so easily get distracted and, 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 and so easily get turned away from the things that matter most. And so I need to be praying that every day. And then I pray that, and then I look for ways to do it. And in regards to this, I think that we all have a responsibility to, to press into justice. And I mean justice as God's form of justice. Like, I know, I know that when certain words and phrases get used, that it triggers all sorts of things and all sorts of people. So I know very well that to talk about, for example, social justice to some people means uh, putting down white people. I get that. I, I see how that happens. Uh, but I'm talking about God's justice, uh, God's view of justice, God's, God's vision of justice. And if, if you don't like one type of language, then let's just focus on the one that God uses. And so what is justice? Justice is in God's language, in, in the language of the scripture, whenever you see justice talked about, I think potentially without exception, but definitely the vast majority of the time, it's always talking about the oppressed, the downtrodden, the people who are, who are it's talking about foreigners, right? So this has implications for our, our whole view of immigration and, and all sorts of things. It's talking about sojourners, people who are passing through. It's talking about anyone who is not in power, who is not an authority, and who is treated in a particular way because of that fact. Do you see the implications here? You know, so that, that means that this steps into that first type of racism is the whole, you know, what are your views? Or do you look down on someone because of their color or background or culture or ethnicity? but it also steps into this second type of racism. You know, I have heard news reports and we don't know yet what's going on because they're all conflicting reports and people are backtracking and changing their words, but there have been reports that these riots are happening, uh, that they've been, uh, there are white nationalists that are supporting these riots, that there are Antifa folks that are supporting these riots, 
that it's people from out of state and out of these cities that are coming in to provoke and, and um, kind of stoke this anger and violence in a response to the killing of George Floyd. And I don't know if that's true, but look, I would not be at all surprised if it were true because humans are, are, can be very wicked. We can be very wicked. And Satan would love nothing more than to instigate more violence and hatred and, and evil and to take advantage of the evil that's already happened to perpetrate more evil. And these things do become, there is a systemic element here. And so we can see it really clearly here. So if someone is in a peaceful protest, let's just, let, you know, whether this is what happened or not, just think about this. If someone is in a peaceful protest and someone else, for whatever their motives, starts setting fires and breaking things and, you know, looting and all that stuff, there is a mob mentality. There is a systemic mentality that takes over and people will join in and do things that they would never do on their own. But the same thing can happen when you have, you know, horrible lending practices. Because it's built into a system, people would do things they would never do on their own. They're just following the rules. They're just doing what they were taught or told to do. The same thing can happen in a justice system that might give a, a two-year sentence to a white man for one crime and a 25-year sentence to a black man for the exact same crime with almost identical circumstances. But it just happens. And if you were to, if you were to, to you know, from one judge, if you were to talk to that judge and say, do you hate black people? He would say, no, of course not. Are you going to treat black people more harshly than white people? No, I wouldn't. But when it gets into this system, and who designs these systems? Who creates these things? Well, it's created by people, but also don't, don't believe for a moment that Satan is not involved because he has authority on this earth right now. He still does. And Jesus is breaking his authority. But in the meantime, Satan is at work and he's active. And he's not active in abstract ways. You know, sometimes we think, uh, you know, anytime I do something wrong, I can blame it on the devil. But then we somehow pretend that he's not acting on a national scale. You know, typically speaking, the devil doesn't have time for you, right? Maybe his demons do. I mean, he's got a lot of demons too. He doesn't have time for you. He's dealing with things at the top. He's ruling the world in a very real sense, and he's trying to run it into the ground. And what we're seeing right now in a lot of respects is an attempt to run our nation into the ground. And I'm not saying it's by the, the rioters. I have, I have a lot of compassion for the people that are out in the streets. I, I don't necessarily agree with their methods, but I have a lot of compassion for them. I think as a country, we have told people who are experiencing hardship that they cannot, uh, they cannot protest peacefully. And we'll say they can, but you know, think what you want about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, but he was doing something peaceful and we should have defended it, even if we disagree with it. Say what you want about basketball players wearing shirts that say, I can't breathe, but that's peaceful. We should have defended it, even if we disagreed with it. But what white America told black America was that you're not allowed to protest like that. So if you don't let someone protest peacefully, eventually they're gonna protest violently. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it will happen. We have to understand this. But even if that weren't true, we should always stand up for the rights of anyone who's either oppressed or even feeling oppressed to be able to speak out, stand up or, or kneel down for the things that they think are right. We need to create that space as a people because that's what humble, merciful, just living does. That's what it's like to be the people of God as we create space for that. And then what we do if we're really acting like the people of God, so we, we pray for the Holy Spirit to work, we look for opportunities for justice, and then we step into the pain with people who are feeling oppressed or who are oppressed. The Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leaders who walked past the man beaten and bloodied on the side of the road were not acting like the people of God. The Samaritan who stepped into the pain of the man beaten and bloodied on the side of the road and at his own expense brought healing, he paid the cost of that oppressive act on behalf of the oppressed 
even though he was not the oppressor. That's what it's like the people of God to do. So we have to be willing to step into the pain of others. Now, if you're on this call and you, and you are in a group that has experienced that, then obviously, you know, be, be a person of, of love and grace and peace and partnership with people in your ethnic group. If you're not, then you still have to be a person of peace and partnership and grace uh, and to stand up and to stand with people in another, a different ethnic group. Because in the end, you know, we know this, it's so true. There really is only one race. And I don't say that to dismiss the differences between and among human beings, because the differences are beautiful and we want to honor them. But in the end, we're all the people of God. There's no slave or free. There's no, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no male or female in the kingdom of God in the sense that all those things exist and they make us different. But before God, we're accepted and we're united the same in Christ. And so we have to be willing to bear in ourselves the burden of injustice on behalf of those who are unjustly treated. And if we don't, then we're denying the law of Christ. Now, it's going to look different for everyone. And this is where discernment and prayer comes in. You, you will not know how to do that if you're not listening to the Spirit and if you're not listening to others. I don't know how to tell you. I can't tell you what to do. I'm still trying to figure out what God's calling me to do. But I know he's calling me to these things, to pray for his leading myself and for others, to um, seek justice wherever I can, to act justly wherever I can, and then to stand with and on behalf of those who are downtrodden. And that includes speaking up for justice, speaking up for truth, speaking up for love, speaking up for grace. And it includes sometimes bearing the burden of, of the hardship because, you know, the reality is that if we're not willing to bear it in ourselves, then it all is going to fall on the people who are already burdened. And what Jesus does is Jesus is God in heaven who is not experiencing the burden of humanity. Jesus steps into humanity to take on our burden for us because he didn't want us to be the ones still bearing it. But now he invites us to do the same thing. He invites us to walk the way he walked, to be empowered by the Spirit, to live as Jesus lived. And this is where the title of the sermon comes back in. You know, we're talking about this racial discord. And I would, my heart, I think all of our hearts is to see a racial peace in this Pentecost Sunday. But racial peace will only come when grace comes. And grace is the process of bearing in yourself a burden for someone else, even if they don't technically deserve it. That's what grace is. You know, we talk about how, we talk about how grace is giving someone, God's grace is giving us what we don't deserve. How is he able to give us what we didn't deserve? He had to pay for it. Whenever you're called to be gracious to someone else, you're giving them something they don't deserve and you have to pay for it. That's the call. That's the call of the gospel. That's the call of Pentecost of the Ten Commandments. And that's the call of Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And he will empower you to live that way. And as he does it for all of us, for each of us, then we will experience uh, a new life in ourselves, in our community, and in our nation. Let's pray.